Hello. <laughs> hey. Hey. I'm thrilled to death that you're both here. Well, how are you, Stephen? Hey, we all three have bookcases. You know, <laughs> I've missed you so much, Jim. I'm, this is such a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Same here, man. Same here. How you doing, Will? I'm doing well, Jim. Good to see you. It's uh, good to be seen anywhere. <laughs> and Stephen, I think the one conversation I've had with you was in person at a TCA party for Showtime. Um, oh, back at, God, 2009, maybe. Showtime. Okay. That that could be Californication it or was. something. Yes, it was. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember when I that my mother... Uh, Beaver, I, I think you know this story. Maybe coming out to California, my mother and I drove from Dallas to California. Mom wanted to drive with me. She, uh, We got an apartment as soon as we came out to L.A., a little tiny place, and she cleaned it. She cleaned huh. the kitchen, the bathroom. We went to uh, Ralph's and got provisions, which was bologna and bread and a six pack of beer. And then mom says, well, I guess I better go home, which is back to <laughs> Dallas. So I, I had to drive her in the car to LAX to get a one way ticket to go back on Trans Texas Airlines. Wow. And mom's parting words to me at the airport was, sweetie, whatever you do, don't go into porno. <laughs> and I ended up meeting you at a Californication party for Showtime. Perfect. That my mother only knew. Uh, uh, that's uh, wow. That I, the closest I can get is that uh, to that story is while I was in probably season thirteen of Supernatural. But, uh, uh, my mother called up and said, uh, I don't know how things are going, but I read that they're hiring at Burger King. <laughs> uh, it's always that great support you always get from your parents. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, um, but apparently I wasn't qualified for Burger King, so I'm, still, I'm stuck doing TV. <laughs> Well, I don't know oh. if either of y'all saw the link that I sent out of the conversation I had with Kurt Fuller and Xander Berkeley uh, last week. Yeah, I watched that. Yeah, they uh, basically I got to speak two or three times. Uh, so do not feel like you're hogging the conversation if you end up telling <laughs> stories back and forth because I'm fine. <laughs> well, I, I've 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 heard Stephen tell enough stories to to figure out that both of us may, uh, both you and I will may uh, just sit back and revel in it. No, my lips are sealed today. I'm, I'm here to listen. Oh boy. Oh, well. Uh, what uh, what's going on with you uh, now, Stephen? I mean, I I know you're you're constantly at work somewhere, but uh, I don't happen to know what's going on at the moment. I uh, I just finished this season of The Goldbergs, which wow. was an amazing thing considering COVID, and. Yeah. Have you been working at Sony, Jim? Oh, I've been at Warner Brothers for the past uh, eight or two months. Sony has been like a, a portrait of attrition over the past two years, is that there, there were shows there, there were game shows there, and over the past two years with COVID, fewer and fewer people have been able to maintain because of COVID. But mm -hmm. the Goldbergs had it all worked out. You know, they're the only ones who figured out how to be able to keep shooting and do the testing and keep everybody safe, even with COVID. And now, at least when I just finished the last show, I could drive into the Sony parking lot on Overland and park on the ground floor. I wow. mean, before... I'd be on the roof. If you're any time after 7 a.m., you're on the roof. You're six stories packed with cars. Nobody is there. Nobody wow. is in the... So I, I finished the Goldbergs, and uh, I've been doing some voiceover, which is yeah. one thing that still is happening in, in COVID times. I, I did a few Archers, 
which mm -hmm. which is always fun to do. And we used to do Archer in the same room together, you, you yeah. know, which was yeah. hilarious to watch. And now it's just all remote and uh, Dick Town, which uh -huh. is quite funny, and a new children's show called Frog and Toad, which is delightful, which my little granddaughter Dior, I'm sure, would love. That's kind of what I've been up to. Oh wow, I've I've never I've never broken into that uh, uh, voiceover that animation voice uh, area. I've uh, uh, is it is it fun? Because I've had a couple of auditions that were not fun because they were so nitpicky about phrasing oh. and uh i thought this is taking a lot of the spontaneity out of it yeah well, but they're all got a job doing that yeah there's there's different kinds of voiceover obviously you, you know you have animation where you're doing a cartoon and so i've done a few of those animation shows and they're mm -hmm. a lot of fun because yeah. basically you just approach it as an actor. Sometimes you have a group read with everybody and then it's super fun yeah. uh, where you're playing off of everybody. But then usually you get the idea with the different producers and writers that they want two or three or four options mm -hmm. uh, to where they can see how they're editing the scene together. And that's fun as an acting exercise. And so when I work on a script beforehand, I always try to see, what are the different ways this scene could go? And so I come in and I have in my head option one, two, three, four, five. And yeah. uh, that that's always fun. Then you have the commercials. When you do commercials, that is terrifying. That is like terrifying because it's a 30 second commercial and they have 31 seconds of copy and they want it at 29 seconds. And mm -hmm. you have no idea how hard that two seconds it is yeah. to, to find that two seconds. And, you know, I'm working with people that are, are, I just am amazed at the people that are really great at voiceover. Like mm -hmm. you take a look at Pam Adlon on, uh, you know, Californication. You know, she's one of the queens of voiceover work with Julia Cato on One Day at a Time. She was one of the queens of Rugrats. You work with those people that are gifted in that mm -hmm. way, which I am not. Yet, you know, I kind of approach it as an actor, but these voiceover people, they are able to carve the Magna Carta on the head of a diamond. You, oh. you know, with their voice, you know, they're able to get in there and create these characters that are just remarkable. And I sit there and just stare in awe at that talent. Mm. Well, I, I've never, uh, like I said, I've never really done that. I've done some, you know, commercial voiceovers, just, you know, uh, you know, bank commercials and stuff like that, but uh, that's great. Not a lot and not in the last 40 years. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh but, uh, uh, I, I used to really want to do that kind of work, but then the the sort of expertise you're talking about has uh, always kind of uh, uh, eluded me. And the more I understood it, the more I realized, oh, maybe that's just not the field where I'm going to be good. And I don't want to do it if I'm not going to be good, or at least a reasonable facsimile. I, 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 did, I did one... Uh trying to think what the show was. It may have been Justice League. I, mm -hmm. I was a regular on Justice League for a while. And I did a scene with a woman in there and she played the mother, the daughter, and the dog in the scene. <laughs> and I was the guy, mother, yeah. daughter, and dog. And so basically she was, darling, yeah, mommy. Yeah. Ruff, ruff. She was, I mean, and she could, again, the turns, it was, it was watching those ice skaters in the Olympics. And you mm -hmm. and I run into people all the time who are starting off in show business that say, well, I can do voiceover because of course I have a voice. But then when you see the kind of talent of the people who are really the tops of, of their game, you go like, mm -hmm. oh my God, it's like Mount Everest. And, yeah. and you know, I'm on this little hill I, I saw one of one of the people who was just hilarious and magnificent. I'm looking at his script, and he has all these marks all over his script. And I'm thinking, I asked him, what what is all of that? 
And he said, well, this mark indicates this is a place where I can do perhaps an ad lib. And then here's the back of the page where I've written my ad libs down, where I think that they can go. You know, when they come, this, this little mark here uh, indicates approaching it this way. And it, it was like an entire city map. And yeah. it was science. It wasn't just it wasn't like pasta. You know, these guys just don't throw pasta against the wall to see if it sticks. It's yeah. like science. It, it, it's an amazing, amazing uh, talent these people have. Well, I feel less and less bad about not <laughs> having to do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, one thing that I, I guess, first of all, I would ask you guys about was uh, the, the legendary two idiots. Since uh, I know I've talked to you a bit about it, Jim, but uh, Stephen, I guess you'd be the one better to give the origin of that whole uh, uh, it was it a, a play first? Is that right? It, yes, it was a play first. I, I remember uh, uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, Beth Henley, uh, she got this apartment that she was going to write in, that she wanted to have a place where she could go write. And so we went in there and we both sat on the floor and we started writing things. And I happened to write Act One <laughs> of Two Idiots in Hollywood. Act One. And 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 it and it underwent very few rewrites. And, <laughs> and I go like, oh, this is pretty easy. You go to best place, you sit on the floor, and you could write a play. Yeah, you know. So then I think, and it took me a week to write Act Two. And so I thought, well, th this went pretty easy. Let's get all the folks together and let let's do a play. Let's just get together and do a play. So we began doing a play, and then it began expanding from that. We thought, well, in the play, the author of the play of Two Idiots in Hollywood, which is T. Barry Armstrong, which in this case was played by actor Tom Calloway. I said, I had been to LAAT. It's what they were called back then, right on Oxford Street or something, Los yeah. Angeles Actors Theater. And I really went to this play for real. And they began the play uh, we were like seven or eight minutes into act one, and then the play stopped. And like the actors were on stage, and then Diane White, the producer, came out and goes, good evening. <laughs> one of our actors apparently is stuck in traffic, and so we're going to take a little pause, and let's talk about the greatness of the theater and how it requires all of us to contribute. If we could take a little moment now to reach into our pocketbooks and maybe, and I'm going like, wait a minute, I'm watching a play here and the actor doesn't show up. He's late and they're hitting me up for money. I already paid tickets for this show. So I thought, well, let's put that into Two Idiots in Hollywood. So I have Tom Calloway in and they have the first scene in Two Idiots. And then Tom from the audience goes, and that, and thus, uh, you know, our characters go up to Hollywood. Hello, I'm T. Barry Armstrong, the author of Two Idiots in Hollywood. And amazingly, the audience started clapping. Like they thought it was for real. He goes, you know, the theater. I love the theater. You know, I first became interested in the theater from watching a, the first thing I wrote was a Mark Twain play. I wanted to be like Hal Holbrook and Mark Twain tonight, a one man Hal Holbrook, but I decided to make it a one woman and make, make uh, Mark Twain a rough kind of Granny Clampa kind of character. And, and he's doing this thing for real. And he says, if you could contribute to, <laughs> to the Mark Twain play, and you know, I'm seeing like people in the audience are like, <laughs> I thought, well, this is pretty good. Why don't we have someone coming into the theater, interrupting the show, like, He's at the wrong theater. And so we just started adding, you know, uh, Scanlon Gale came in and said, oh, excuse me, interrupted act one and said, uh, are you guys doing skits in here? And then T. Barry in the audience says, no, this is a play. Can't you see the, this is a play. You're interrupting act one. Oh, sorry, sorry guys. Okay, just before I go, do you know where the Matrix Theater is? I'm, I'm like, I'm supposed to see a show at the Matrix. Well, I'm supposed to be a girl from the Matrix, but yes, it's down the street. Just go down the street. You're already interrupting the show. So he leaves and then he comes back later at the end of act one and says, uh, you know, I am an actor. And if you, I have a picture and resume, <laughs> could I leave the picture? And by the end of the show, he's in the play. And then I thought, well, what we need to add to this is his audition. 
And so I asked to Scanlon, I said, what do you do? Do you do anything interesting, Scanlon? He says, well, I could calf rope. And I said, you're kidding. You could calf rope? Yeah. I said, why don't we calf rope on Melrose Avenue? You know, uh, we'll get this parking space. And he says, well, I have a fake cow. I said, you have a fake cow? He says, yeah, that's how you practice calf rope. Because I said, bring your fake cow and, and at intermission, you be out there auditioning and you be calf roping on Melrose Avenue. We'll put the cow on the sidewalk. We'll have this parking spot and you'll stand on the roof of your car and you'll calf rope. And then some of the people in the cast said, well, we want to watch him calf rope. And I said, well, we'll have you watch him calf rope, but it's unlucky for an audience to see actors in a show in their costume. So you'll all have to wear bags over your heads. So we have everyone in the cast come out from the alleys while the audience is out there smoking cigarettes, talking about act one. All these people come out with bags on their heads to watch him calf rope. So the whole thing grew from that. So we had a producer, uh, David Lancaster. He was in the house the first week. He says, let's do a movie of this. Uh, and uh, so this is the thing I found, Beaver. I have found in our business, people certainly know what failure looks like. You know, <laughs> we're confronted with it every day. But a lot of times we don't know what success looks like. Mm -hmm. And you know, and so people are always thinking, I'm not enough. I got to do something. Oh, I, I have recurring, I have a recurring role on TV. Why can't I be a regular? Oh, I'm on TV. Why can't I be in movies? Yeah, you know, it just keeps growing. We, we mm -hmm. keep piling failure on our heads. But with two idiots in Hollywood, we had a bunch of actors who were unemployed. They were unemployed by me too. They all <laughs> did it for free. Uh, that I remember. <laughs> yes, we, we had we had great reviews in the LA Times and the Herald Examiner. Uh, California Magazine gave it five stars, saying it's not to be missed. We had a producer who went to school with us. <laughs> Got to put that in there, and who, who said let's let's do a movie with a two million dollar budget, wow. two million dollar budget, and then like to say like guys do you want to be in the movie and and it was a real hollywood success success story on such a micro level i mean nobody made any money off of it for real but it was an example of just doing something and it's succeeding that was two idiots in hollywood it was it was ridiculous and uh i think the the greatest funnest thing for me was I was in New York directing uh, the Miss Firecracker contest. So that's 1984. We did Two Idiots like right in 80. We opened February 2nd, Groundhog Day of 84. Right after that, I went to New York to direct Miss Firecracker. I'm walking down the sidewalk and Tom Calloway lived in New York so he was visiting his apartment in New York and we're walking down the sidewalk together and this guy across the street goes, oh my God, it's T. Barry Armstrong. And he starts <laughs> waving and he comes running over and says, I just was in Los Angeles and I saw your play, Mr. Armstrong. And I think it was really, really wonderful. And I'm standing next to Tom going like, this, it can't get any better than this. This is a joke that just keeps going on. Just loved it. But it was, you know, Two Idiots in Hollywood was, was absolutely hilarious. And it was so fun to work on. It was just a party. We just yeah, had a great yeah. time. That was my first show in Los Angeles. That was, oh, you're uh, kidding. Oh, no, it was first. Uh, well, I, 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 had, I had done something before I lived here. I came out and did something very briefly a, a couple of years before. But after I moved here in 83, it was the first thing I, it was the first thing I ever did. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh I, I remember, you know, you, you, you mentioned some of the great reviews, but I also loved the fact that even the poster for the play had a lot of the quotes from bad reviews. Yes. Uh, you know, an utter waste of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> LA Daily News well, or whatever. Variety, variety said, uh, beneath the dignity of a nine-year-old. 
was their <laughs> review. Uh, or or it, it could have been even younger, like Beneath the Dignity of a, a, a seven-year-old. You know, but it's a terrible review. Variety just did it. So I said, like, let's blow it up. Let's put it in front of the theater. This yeah. is the one we wanted there. So it was Two Idiots in Hollywood at Theater Theater. And it says the big banner beneath the dignity of nine-year-olds variety. <laughs> That's a, and then uh, the you know this is all coming back to me in shades <laughs> of mediocrity, like emptiness and harmony. I so the lobby of you know uh, Bailey was saying like, well, we need we need somehow to decorate the lobby of of the theater, and I said underwear. Why don't why doesn't everyone bring a pair of underwear that means something? Because everyone all all these actors always put eight by their eight by tens. I said it's so boring. You see all these eight by tens and all this stuff, and nobody looks at it. You know, well, I'm going to see them inside. So let's have underwear that you wore someplace special. So I remember Bill Stice. He had underwear that he wore in a motorcycle accident in the Alps. Cat uh, <laughs> Sawyer Young brought underwear that she wore in her first R-rated movie. I rem and and uh, suddenly, like the lobby is filled with underwear, and everyone is in the lobby going like, "Holy, holy mackerel!" What is? And then, oh, another thing, another thing I did, which I thought was like, when you go to see a play, I remember. Uh, did Did you know Tony Campisi, Jim? I didn't. I know I knew the name, in, but in New yeah. York, Tony Tony uh, was a uh, boyfriend with Kathy Bates for many many years. Friends of Jim McClure and that whole group in in New York, and Tony Campisi was the understudy in the normal heart of Richard Dreyfus, and Kathy Bates was the leading lady in the normal heart in its swing through L.A. And God, was she brilliant! Mm. Anyway, I get a phone call from Tony Campisi saying, Tobo, can you come to the show this afternoon because Richard Dreyfus is sick and I have to go on. And I need every friend I have there. And so we went, here's another tale of victory. Uh, so we went to see Tony do the show. And of course they have to announce at the beginning of the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the role of so-and-so usually played by Richard Dreyfus. Today will be played by Tony Campisi. And there was a full audience groan. <laughs> like, and I'm thinking, how to be an actor and to hear, oh God, no, no, no. This is why we came to see the play. We came to see Richard Dreyfus. We don't even know this, Kathy Bates. We hear she's good, but but Richard Dreyfus is why. So anyway, Tony came out facing this hostile, hostile crowd. And he stayed with it, and he stayed with it. And at the end of act one, there was a bit of silence and a little applause. And then he comes out and he has this huge speech at the beginning of act two. And he put his heart and soul in it, this whole monologue. And then there was applause at the end of his speech. And the applause didn't stop. The applause kept going. And Tony was holding and holding. Kathy is on stage, and you could see she's turning red. Her eyes are filling with tears. It, it and Tony just stays and stays. And finally, Kathy kind of nods at him, and Tony kind of turns to the audience and and does not a Renaissance bow, but but turns and a, a non acknowledging the audience at the end of the show, standing ovation, standing ovation uh, for Tony. So I figured. For two idiots in Hollywood, we had to somehow have this moment in the show. Not of Tony's triumph, because the show was going to be too bad for that. But the not having people in the play. So we had this chalkboard, like you have at restaurants. And so I made up, see, nobody knows two idiots in Hollywood was an unknown play. So I wrote like fake fake names of, of characters and people. So uh, <laughs> the, the role of Sam Wadam, normally played by Sally Babylonia tonight, is going to play by, uh, you know, Henry Pachetti, you know, and all this stuff. And the audience is looking at, like, 
all these understudies that are beyond tonight and they were seriously <laughs> disheartened what we're not gonna we have to see cindy pacetti instead of sam babylonia tonight you know we, we, and everybody i said let's make up some names let's get some names here and then and the chalkboard got bigger and bigger each time with the number of people that weren't going to be in the show tonight that were going to be replaced ah uh, god but that came from tony campisi uh -huh. at, well, we obviously could spend this entire thing talking about two idiots. No, so yeah. Uh, Please, but, I'm done. I'm uh, done with two idiots. Uh, no, well, it was, it was a it was a great experience for me because I I, I met so many people who are still friends now, and uh, um, uh, I, I came into the show as a replacement. Um, uh, although I didn't get my Tony Campisi monologue. Uh, <laughs> 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 but um, uh, you know, the, I'm listening to you talk about this, and I'm remembering all the experiences. I'm thinking I, it may be time for a revival. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you still got that variety blow up, yeah. You know, I, I was such an idiot. I was when I was in New York at Manhattan Theater Club. They said, "Well, can we see two idiots in Hollywood? We'd like to consider it, you know." For and I go, "Nah, it's okay." <laughs> I mean, you know, I didn't know what success looked like. You know, yeah, I was an idiot. Yeah. Well, how yeah. did you guys first meet? I have my story. You do yours. Okay. <laughs> well, my story, my story is that I that I I knew who Stephen was before I ever met him, because I saw him in um, uh, I saw him in the lead of Godspell at theater three in Dallas in about 1980, 81. No, it must've been before that. It was more like 74, 75. Yeah, I think. I think, I think it was seven, I think it was 74. It was after I had graduated, the year after I graduated. So I think 74. Yeah. And, uh, and I, the, the, he, he was fabulous and, uh, 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 and his name stuck in my head and I knew he was a local, uh, Dallas actor, uh, but we didn't, we didn't meet there. My, my recollection of when we actually connected was opening night of crimes of the heart in, uh, Louisville. And, uh, Beth was off being the playwright of the night. And, uh, uh, you and I ended up at a table sitting and talking and, and, realizing how many people we had in common and all of that. That's my recollection. I, I think that's close to mine. I, I remember you in your raincoat standing at the bar of the, of the little bar kind of oh. thing at the uh -huh. Los Angeles uh, uh, Actors Theater of Louisville. It uh -huh. was kind of that gray green raincoat or whatever. <laughs> oh, right. and, and, and your red hair and, and you were there and we met there, I believe. And that's when you, you started talking and I didn't know you were a, a playwright at that point in time. And yeah. that's when I found out you were a playwright and not, I just thought you were one of the actors at, at yeah, Actors no. Theater. I never acted at, at Louisville. Uh, uh, they did three, three plays of mine, but they never, but I never acted there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and I was there because one of my plays was on, that was the Humana Festival. Um, uh, um or the old great american play contest that period and uh they were doing a piece of mine and uh um and fortunately for me being there as one of the playwrights i got to see all these other plays and uh uh and so you know I, i've always prided myself that i was there opening night of the first production of crimes of the heart and uh uh and on top of which, uh, I, I got to meet you, and uh, um, and we've been bitter enemies ever since. Bitter, 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 bitter. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, Jim had for me, you know, in terms of life changing stories. You know, you run into them occasionally. Now, for me, nothing with two idiots was kind of life changing, except maybe the guy running up to Tom Calloway in New York. <laughs> you never know when what part of a story is going to be life changing, but that was an example of where what happened in the theater stepped out of that boundary 
and became reality. Yeah. It was amazing. But Jim's story f from Vietnam, uh, the story when, when we were, I guess we were doing uh, in country. Yeah. When yeah. we were doing in country. I wonder if is that when I heard the story, I may have heard it beforehand, but when you were, your name was on the wall. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. story, that story has blown my mind forever as, yeah. as I mean. Well, I, yeah, I, um, uh, I had, I had, when I was in Vietnam, uh, one day, uh, a guy came into the mess hall and and he looked at me and said, "Hey!" And then he stopped dead and went, "Wait a minute! You you're supposed to be dead." And uh, and I, I said, "What? What?" He says, "No, I back at uh, uh, Camp Pendleton, we saw your name on a casualty list, and everybody everybody back at the old outfit thinks you're dead." And uh, I thought, well, nobody told me. Uh, and um, then flash forward any number of years, and I went to the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington, and I remembered that guy saying that. I thought, well, that you know, that seems really weird. And I, they've got books there that list everybody and where they where their names are on the wall. And I looked it up. And there's two of me on the wall. Uh, the, uh, the only difference being middle initials. And uh, uh, I just found that, yeah, uh, kind of life-changing because it, it sent me down this mental path of what if. And uh, what if it had been me? What if it hadn't been one of them? Right. And uh, and you can go a long way down that rabbit hole, <laughs> and uh, uh, and I've I I always found it very moving, but also kind of frightening, and um, uh, and, and it's yeah it's weird finding your own name on a list of dead people, um, but uh, yeah I guess that probably had. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd certainly that had that had happened by the time we did in country together. So that's probably where I told you. But uh, uh, I don't know about you, but you know, I had no connection to the military in my life at all. And I know you're a Marine, right? Yeah. You, and 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 so but during that period of time when we were doing in country, for whatever reason, I guess people felt it was safe enough to revisit the Vietnam War, yeah. which I still look back at with horror, and I go like, huh? And I got cast as uh, a soldier and as a veteran many times during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of something working on In Country where I got to work with you and to somebody who was really there, you know, the whole thing of stolen valor, there, yeah, there yeah. is something about actors that are always living with stolen valor in one mm -hmm. way or another because of what we do, but you never did. And yeah. the, well, we're always playing people braver than we actually. <laughs> are. I, I lucked out on that show on, on in country because of one reason and that is i had a tattoo on my chest as a character which they had to paint on now we we were shooting in paducah and mayfield kentucky and the temperature as i recall and i'm not exaggerating uh i believe is 114 degrees but yeah. that is like outdoors and that is not indoors with lights yeah you know it, it would be You're like committed. close to 150 degrees indoors so yeah. the tattoo would melt which yeah. which holds up production so yeah. what they did with me is they would paint the tattoo on in the morning and put me in an air-conditioned room uh, and I sat in the again stolen valor I yeah. sat in the air-conditioned room until they pulled us out and sat us down at the table 
to do uh, if we ever would sit down at the table and do a scene <laughs> in that 150 degree. You, you know, the um, when audiences come to see a movie, they don't know really the climate which yeah. in which a scene is shot in, but that was shot in a, about 150 degrees. Wow. Would you rather shoot in 150 degrees that doesn't look like 150 degrees or shoot in 12 degrees that doesn't look like 12 <laughs> 150. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Both extremes are awful, but uh, I think I'll take the heat. But <laughs> Oh, my God. How many times, Jim, how many times, now I've, I've done this, obviously, or I wouldn't ask the question, but how many times have you in, here in Los Angeles where it's mm -hmm. nice and warm, had to play a scene in the winter in Los, where you're, it's winter time in Los Angeles, but you have to play summer. So you're wearing a, a t-shirt, shorts, and it's really like 40 degrees with wind. Yeah, well, I, uh, enough times that it's been uncomfortable. I, I've had much more experience with the other extreme. Uh, I mean, doing Deadwood, the, uh, uh, the first season was, uh, uh, well, I guess the seconds, I forget exactly which, but uh, I remember we were doing basically, I think, spring in uh, uh, the Dakotas. And so we're all in three or four layers of wool outfits. And uh, uh, I know the first season they had little to no air conditioning. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, people were falling over like flies who weren't wearing three layers of wool and um uh, i yeah that was that was a that was a tough one i've had most of my freezing while wearing well my very first movie i think was uh the thing shot in dallas uh called semi tough mm -hmm. and uh and there's a, a a football game at the end of it's supposed to be the super bowl and they shot it in dallas in January or so and uh, we're all out there like you say in shorts and short sleeve shirts and oh my gosh uh, you know people think of Texas is warm but Dallas in January is no that's not warm uh, <laughs> and, and, and we were we were freezing out there but uh, you know whenever they'd call cut you know, Burt Reynolds would get his big puffy coat on and uh, Chris Christopherson would get his big puffy coat on. And the further down the list, the less <laughs> they provided. <laughs> so, well, uh, you had to be semi-tough. You had to be. You had to be semi-tough, <laughs> yeah. You know, when, uh, when, when, when I was doing Deadwood, I guess season two and three, uh, mm -hmm. Jim in particular and Powers were like the good kids in the dormitory. You know, like Jim and Powers instructed me as to what happens and what doesn't happen. And 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 you couldn't have better guides. You couldn't have better guides, you know, uh, just because it, the shooting was difficult doing, I mean, the shooting for Deadwood was amazing. Yeah. And and difficult, at least, I found it, be because of the idea that we had to shoot in all kinds of weather. So mm -hmm. if it was pouring rain, you were out in the street in your three levels of wool, yeah. clothing, slogging in, in huge. And, and I remember it was the scene where uh, Tim is taking me to jail, and there's a mule or a little horse in front of me, and as... I'm doing my speech and I'm in handcuffs and he's taking me to jail and dead. the horse lifts up his tail or his mule and just craps all over me, craps all over my, my uh, pants and my shoes. And David Milch is going like, perfect, perfect, <laughs> wonderful. And then uh, David Milch comes up to me and Stephen, the special thing about this is on Deadwood, we don't wash the clothes because we want the stains to be consistent, show to show to show. These people, so you're going to be living with that for the rest of the season. You know, the things that David Milch would get so excited about. God, that was that was an amazing experience, though, and especially with with that that company of 
Oh. Not only company of actors, you know, you and Powers, my God. And uh, Tim, everybody was so good on that show. Ian McShane, everyone was so good on that show. But also the technical people yeah. were so damn good. I, I remember one episode, we had two camera crews working, and one of the camera crews was working was the same crew I had worked with on Mississippi Burning with Alan Parker. Oh, wow. It was like mm -hmm. the best of the best of the crew. And the one of my favorite Deadwood memories was your wedding oh, on Deadwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It was when it was com combined with, what, South Dakota or whatever, getting statehood. And I'm up mm -hmm. having a scene with, with Tim and Ian. And then I come downstairs, and all the whores are in the bar dancing, and you're out in the street. Uh, and it was... As an actor, there are very few times that you really, as an actor, feel transported. Usually you yeah, just feel yeah, you're yeah. in torture. But <laughs> but at that moment, that wedding, your wedding was so beautiful. Just yeah. the entire yeah. night, the entire scene, the everything was exquisite. Because and, everybody you know, in the show, everybody in the show was in that scene. Half the crew was in the scene. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the and and it was we were portraying a party a celebration, but it in many ways was a celebration. We were it was the end of the season, uh, uh, so we were wrapping up the season as well as uh, the storyline of these characters in a in a situation, and I rem I just remember feeling like I'm out here on the street on the thoroughfare in Deadwood with, with all these lights and cameras and crew people. And yet I'm also here in 1877 in the middle of this muddy town with all my friends. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was, as you say, transportive. <laughs> and, uh, but do you remember that, that, uh, we shot the first night and they had to do it over again because of, uh, because there was a scratch on the film. Uh, oh God. Yeah. Of the, the wedding scene? A, a large portion of it. Oh, we had God. to do over again. Uh, yeah, there was some technical problem with the film. I guess it was film. Uh, I know that there was, uh, there was some reason that they had to do it over again. And uh, I recall Powers in particular was, very unhappy about that but uh yeah you know it's um uh, you do things and magic happens and then they say oh we forgot to roll <laughs> <laughs> it was i mean i mean the classic thing david milch would do is you, you would kind of rehearse a scene in the in the street and and like i'd have a scene with bill sanderson or something and we would rehearse in the street and then david milch would look at and says Yes, but now we need a cattle stampede. Let's <laughs> let's get the cattle and and you know they had like a hundred cattle stashed somewhere and they <laughs> they brought them in and now Bill and I are doing this scene and it's like whoa <laughs> cattle and we, we you know we ended up doing it on opposite sides of the street and the cattle were in, and we're like yelling across the street so you know just crazy I mean you. A uh, death defying, death defying. Yeah. Edward was too, too much. Yep. And and lest anybody think otherwise, the the entire process of doing that show was different. I think from any acting experience any <laughs> actor has ever had. <laughs> you, you nobody nobody says, "Oh yeah, this is just like it was on Deadwood." Right. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> nothing nothing there there is the the level i mean the level of danger uh, again this is an oft-told story of mine from deadwood but again it was transformative it was i think my entrance into season three and i was coming in on a horse and they wanted me to ride in on a horse and i've been riding a lot at that time it's before i broke my neck so i've been riding a lot knew how to ride a horse it was a hot day and before we're trying to get the conditions right for my horse to come in and one of the extras uh, apparently dropped dead Jeez. from the heat 
just wow. you know from the heat standing out there in the you know kind of collapse passed out and they go Stephen, uh if you could just wait a second for your entrance a little bit more we were having a little situation over here with the crowd and and so i kind of get my horse kind of around the corner i'm, I'm kind of looking and i witness this scene and uh they're like trying to put this guy on a stretcher and he and he's out there and he goes everybody and I'm I'm making this name up. I I don't quite. I think his name was Dan. Was the was the extra who mm -hmm. collapsed on the street. Everyone, we all have loved Dan. We've all loved what Dan has contributed to this production, a lot. Now we have medics that are on their way to take Dan to a medical facility to try to make Dan okay again. But you know what Dan loved more than anything else. He loved this show. He loved Deadwood. And I think the best tribute we could do is get back to one and let's shoot it again. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm the horse, the guy's body is lying in the street. We still haven't drug, drug him off yet. And now all the extras, you know, they're all going back to one like, okay, here we go. <laughs> wait, wait, we got to wait to drag Dan off. You know, we never did quite find out if Dan made it or not. Yeah, you know that. You know, but they dragged him off. It was like, we're, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get this thing done. We're gonna get this thing done. It was, it was, it was. But but like you said, it was so good. If you um, under, I mean, how many times have you undergone kind of difficult production conditions? And the product was not any good. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. know, a lot of times it's symptomatic of oh, well, this is going to stink. The thing about Deadwood was it was not only good; it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen on television. Just yeah. the the level of storytelling and the quality and everything about it was so good, and yet it was catastrophic <laughs> day to day. You never because <laughs> David always David Milch always wanted to shoot in as the sun went he wanted to start shooting when the sun rose he wanted that light in the show and so we were i don't know i think i remember a few breakfasts with you in the pitch black in the morning yeah. you know 5 a.m you, you're there at 5 a.m you rehearse in the dark with the director of the show and then in the dark david milch comes up and takes a look at what you've done and gives other comments and then you go back and as soon as that sun comes up you start shooting yeah yeah at dawn. even if he's, even if he's rewritten the scene in the moments before so yeah it was an extraordinary experience I, uh, one of the best i'd do it again I would. I would. It was, it was, if I had the strength, I'd do it again. Yeah. Oh God. All right. I'll ask you one of my stock questions. Uh, who was the first person that you remember working with on a project that you had to keep yourself in check because you were about to fanboy out? Mm. Well, there was this Tobolowski guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Oh, uh. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, um, <laughs> uh, the very first thing I ever did on camera, uh, I was, I was an extra in a terrible movie called The Seniors that was <laughs> shot in Dallas. And, um, now you got to understand that I am an old movie buff from way back and I know far too much about that stuff. And I'm on this movie and all of the leads are at the time complete unknowns. Most of them kind of still are, but uh, uh, in the supporting cast, they brought in some character guys from Hollywood and one of these guys, and I'm, I'm an extra outside the office in which the scene is taking place, but I'm in the background somewhere. But one of these guys is an actor named Ian Wolf. Now, Ian Wolf played old men in the early 30s. 
And this is 1977. <laughs> and now if you look up Ian Wolf on IMDb or something and see his face, you'll go, oh, that guy. Of course. I mean, he was in The Adventures of Robin Hood and, and he's in Captain Blood and he's, you know, and I am kind of geeking out because I'm in a movie with a guy who was in Captain Blood. And, at, and I'm talking to the other extras and they're all going, who? Who? I, the, the old guy? Okay, <laughs> but I am kind of kvelly. And uh, uh, so it wasn't so much, you know, some big star. It was just somebody I knew from way back at the dawn of time who was still around long enough to be in a movie with me. <laughs> oh, I got it. Before I let you answer, Steve, I got to tell you the sequel to that little movie thing. <laughs> Years later, many years later, in the uh, <laughs> mid nineties, uh, I'm I'm in back when they had video stores. I'm mm. I'm in some video store and I'm thumbing through DVDs, and I see a DVD for this movie, The Seniors. <laughs> the only person in that movie who had a career after that really <laughs> was Dennis Quaid. Uh, and it was his first or second movie and he was still a texas boy and he had and he's one of the leads in it but it's nothing he tells people about i'm sure <laughs> but the the astonishing thing to me was on this dvd it says the seniors starring dennis quaid jim beaver <laughs> and priscilla barnes I have no lines in this movie. I have no character in this movie. I actually play two different people in different scenes. I'm just an extra, but I ended up on the DVD cover, which the leads on the film did end up on. Are you in an action pose on the cover? You know, like, like they've no, done they a squade. They, they couldn't even find a frame with me in it to you. <laughs> Oh. oh, your story, Stephen. Okay, this is pretty embarrassing. <laughs> uh, my fanboy story is one of the first jobs I got that was a legitimate job in film and television was a film called TV movie called Cocaine and Blue Eyes starring O.J. Simpson. And I was so fanboying out meeting O.J. Simpson. I could not believe I was meeting the juice. And this was, of course, before the murders. Sure. And got to got to put that asterisk in there. <laughs> and, and I played again a character with no name. I played porno clerk. <laughs> and so we went into some porno store on Hollywood Boulevard. And OJ and I, he played a detective, and I am a porno clerk. <laughs> and and we rehearsed the scene, and then we went out to our dressing rooms and. It took like a couple hours and I'm going like, what is the setup? What what's taking so long? And we went back into the into the porno shop and OJ felt he was too short compared to me and wanted the floor built up wherever he walked <laughs> to where he would be taller than I was in the film in the film. Wow. So and and uh on IMDB for the longest time. I was listed as porno clerk, but they've edited it now. And on IMDb, I am now clerk. Did you want me to try to get that fixed for you? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they took out they took out the porno just to give it a little more dignity. Thank you very much. But after the I was remember calling home. I was so excited with mom and dad. I work with OJ Simpson today. I've made it. <laughs> Before the murders. <laughs> Oh, that's a worse, worse asterisk than Roger Maris has um, <laughs> for the murders. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> uh, um, I, uh, I got to, I got to work with some, some, some good big time people in Dallas before I ever came out here. I did, as I mentioned, I did semi-tough. I, I, I got to spend a little bit of time actually 
chatting with Burt Reynolds and uh, 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 wonderful Burt Convey, who was also on that movie. And um, that was, it, it was a real thrill for me, but at the same time, I, I don't know why, I didn't, I didn't approach it like, uh, like I expected myself to approach it in, in a kind of babbling fanboy geekish uh, uh, freak out. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just, oh, yes. Good morning, Mr. Reynolds. How are you? No, call me Bert. Okay, Bert. Uh, I, this fake Savoir Faire uh, 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 to, uh, <laughs> to go with Scanlon's fake cow. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't know when... I don't know that I ever reached a point where there was somebody that I, you know, I, I just babbled around that I couldn't, couldn't keep it together about. There are people that I think if I'd gotten to work with them, I would have been that way. Yeah. But I, I don't recall it ever quite being, uh, uh, I, I, allowing my starstruck nature to reveal itself. Yeah. But uh, um, you might have uh, seen my. You might have seen my story on Facebook before uh, how I had to learn to suck up fanboy tendencies at the TCA tour where the very first time I walked into one, uh, Anthony Stewart head was in the lobby. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my God, it's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I'm just <laughs> so ecstatic. And I get on my cell phone and I'm calling my wife like, you're not going to believe it, I just saw Giles. And as I'm doing that, I realize I'm walking directly behind Dick Van Dyke. And I'm like, I'm... I've really got to step this up. I, <laughs> I can't be calling my wife every two seconds saying, oh my God, guess who I just saw? And so that was literally a turning point in the second I walked into that, that hotel was, I just got to treat them like people. <laughs> it's, been, it's been harder for, for me, uh, not for myself, but with my family. I've had a couple of times where I've taken family members onto a set to... Uh, just see how things are done. And uh, uh, I, I remember I was at an event, it wasn't a set, but I was at an event uh, uh, a few years ago with, and I, I brought my sister to it and I, I brought her into the, into the, the green room and uh, where all the actors were waiting. I said, well, look, this is, this is where we all come to get away from the fan and relax and just be, you know, just let our hair down and stop being on. And I said, so be very, very cool in here. And my sister said, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, no problem. And eight seconds after we walked into the room, she saw Christopher Lloyd and she, <laughs> zipped away from me <laughs> and got up to him and said, oh, Mr. Lloyd, I am such a big fan and I think you're the most wonderful in the world. And, and he was like, oh, thank you. He was very gracious, very lovely. And then she said what she said and she got a picture with him. And then she came back to me and she said, some things you just can't help. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the one the one person that always had me tongue-tied uh, always wanted to meet was julie haggerty oh, wow. and yet you know i always just thought she was a brilliant actress i thought she was wonderful and i i auditioned for um uh freddie got fingered yeah, Freddie got yeah. fingered because Julie was going to be in the show. And I got cast in Freddie Got Finger. Tom Green cast me. He did cut me out. Asterisk, Tom Green did cut me out of the movie entirely. However, I did go shoot the movie. I got to meet Rip Torn. But the whole point of doing the movie was to see Julie Haggerty. And, every, and we were shooting in Canada. And every time it was time for me to shoot a scene, it was the time for her to go back to Los Angeles. So the 10 weeks I was shooting Freddie Got Fingered and getting cut, in, cut out of the film, I never met Julie once. And then, not that long afterwards, like, talk about fate. 
I went and auditioned for Mornings at 7 in New York. I got cast, and she got cast as my girlfriend. <laughs> and wow. we were on stage on Broadway for, what, 10 months? And then we came out and did the Amundsen for three months. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were best of buds. We were best friends ever and and it was like a dream come true. It, it's one thing when you see somebody on the silver screen and you're just a fan, you do have this larger than life attachment to them mm -hmm. that you don't get in real life. And when you do find that, it's enormous. Like Julie and I are still like best friends ever. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. I just I'm actually working on, I'm actually yeah. working on a book with Zucker Abrams and Zucker right now about their career. So I was able to talk to uh, to Julie for the book and she was I was ecstatic that she was just as sweet as she always I always thought she was <laughs> she wow. just just great she yeah. she's just amazing oh god yeah <laughs> well, I know we're about to hit the hour mark so I'll close with my uh stock question I would like to ask everybody do you have a favorite project that you've worked on over the years that didn't get the love you thought it deserved it could be more than one but but be it a play a, a film a, a tv pilot didn't get picked up anything Oh, God. It's hard to count them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, the things that really, like, like I could take a look at One Day at a Time, which was an exceptional show. Yep, it was an enormously good show on Netflix, and it doubled its audience every year for three years, and then Netflix canceled it, you know. And I have no idea why. It, it got a lot of love. It was, it was an extraordinary... Uh, experience great cast great writers and everything and y you have to cherish those you know in country i thought was a wonderful experience a wonderful show and yeah. uh in all sorts of ways it, yeah. it was moving to work on the show and it was it was great executing it uh you know i just i just don't know if it got the love it deserved yeah i, I feel the same way about that i uh you, you mentioned uh, working with Alan Parker on uh, Mississippi Burning. I did what I think may have been his last film, uh, uh, The Life of David Gale, which uh, was a, a wonderful experience to work on. And then it came out and the critics crucified it, absolutely destroyed it. And yet I have never met a person who's seen it, who wasn't a critic, who didn't love it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I don't know, to me, it was, a, it was a pretty wonderful movie. And I was, there was a case where, oh my gosh, I'm working with Sir Alan Parker. Uh, I was pretty, uh, 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 I was pretty goggle-eyed over that experience. But uh, that was one that I thought, this the critics should have liked this better everybody else did yeah. and uh, but i don't know if that i don't know i don't know how much that that matters if everybody else likes something then maybe it's a success but uh i think it hurt alan i think it i think it seriously hurt him and i don't know for sure whether this is true or not but I've always wondered if that's why he didn't make anything or much after that. Um, I don't know, but um, it's it, you know it it's it's rare when you meet people like him in the business. You know, mm -hmm. of probably Alan and uh, Harold Ramis. Those two people working with those two people were like magnificent experiences and and you know that i guess in every profession you have a chance for a magnificent experience but but certainly in what we do because what we do is so kind of trivial it, you know like i say to my brother he's a doctor you know he saved somebody's life one day we do nothing we we provide entertainment and maybe insight on something every once in a while but just basically we fill the time with entertainment it I've had so many, you know, meetings like with Alan or with Harold Ramis that, that change you. And for me, that's been the reward because you never can tell 
how a, how a project will be accepted or rejected by the public. I remember Groundhog Day got kind of okay reviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. not like great greatest comedy in the last 50 years, nothing like that. But you know, okay review, you, you can't Were tell. You in that? I would, I was in that. Hey, you know, but I did have, a <laughs> I did have a problem with that on the show Minx I just did. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was on HBO. Yeah. And uh, I had to take a punch in that. And so I was just trying to tell the girl who had to punch me just once you start to punch and then I'm going to fall. And she goes, you know about punches? I said, well, yeah, I've taken punches before. And he goes, yeah, he took a punch in Groundhog Day, you know, where Bill Murray punches him, he goes down to the ground. And she goes, oh, you know, I heard that's a good movie. You know, sometime, you know, I'll, yeah, I should see that maybe. I'll put that on the will watch list. You know, yeah. so it's done. You know, what yeah. we do, yeah. whether it's good or bad, is done. And that helps somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> that's why we have bookcases in the back. These yeah. guys aren't done. Right. <laughs> I have plenty more to read. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys both so much for doing this. I'm glad we had the opportunity to chat, and I'm glad you guys got the opportunity to chat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like it's, I said, it's, it's, it's a, a joy for me always to be in Stephen's company. I, yeah. I I adore him, and uh, and I look up to him, and not just because he's taller. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> and and Jim is uh, one of the best actors ever and uh one of the best writers ever and he's a dear friend and uh i love him to death so i i uh, uh, i appreciate that meeting in the louisville bar it's one of those things that's lasted yeah for me as well for me as well yeah take care brother you too Thank Thank you guys so much. have a good one appreciate it okay bye guys bye bye, -bye. thanks